Well, thank you for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to get out to a new church and meet new faces. Um, we have a, a practice, I'm Dr. Emerson, we have a practice in internal medicine up in Myersville, Maryland. It's near Frederick and Hagerstown, Maryland, just between those two uh, cities. We do uh, just regular patient care, but we also do 3D intensives where people come, they learn about uh, cancer, they learn about things that we can do to help support them in their fight against cancer. Um, we train them in juicing. Uh, we serve them vegan meals. My wife does training in uh, cooking classes and how to prepare the foods that will help your body immune system to be strong and fight cancers. Uh, we do lectures. We also do uh, thermal hydrotherapy where we raise the body temperature up to turn on the immune system to help it fight cancer. We're going to be learning more about how that works this afternoon. It's one of the more effective means of uh, strengthening the body uh, and getting effective results. We're going to be sharing with you some of the results that have been obtained by heating up the body or heating up the tumor itself. Um, I'm also a medical director at the Heartland Lifestyle Center down in, well, it's near Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, we do 11-day programs for regular lifestyle diseases, diabetes, hypertension, weight control, heart disease. But we also do uh, cancer support as well. And uh, it's an 11-day program, but we're extending it after January 1st to 17 days because it takes that long usually to get, to get everything up to speed uh, where we want it to, to be. Um, today we're going to be... Uh, talking about uh, things that we do and the results that are obtained with intravenous vitamin C. Uh, also, we're going to look at certain herbs, herbal teas that have been used. And uh, we'll also look at uh, some detoxification that can help cleanse the body of toxins that are released when cancer cells die. Um, some of the things I'm not going to be able to go in detail about, which are helpful, I just want to make you aware of, uh, things that can help decrease your risk of getting cancer. Uh, the China study, T. Colin Campbell, in that, he demonstrated the risk coming from milk proteins. Uh, he said that when you have uh, mice and they're exposed to an aflatoxin produced by funguses, it can cause liver cancer in the rats. Now, if the rats got 5% or less milk protein in their diet, None of them got the cancer, but if it was 20% or more of the milk protein casein, 100% got cancer. And so avoiding those types of products can be helpful in preventing the incidence of cancer. Uh, exercise, we won't get to go into detail about that, but exercise has decreased the risk or incidence of cancers. Different cancers are affected differently by exercise. The decrease in incidence over a seven-year period was shown to drop by 6% up to 27%, depending on the cancer, with exercise. Uh, the exercise is measured in METS, that's metabolic equivalent um, tasks. Uh, you can get, say, three METS if you're walking three miles an hour. And if you do that for an hour, that's three MET hours. If you get walking at, say, four miles an hour, that is five METs. And if you take the number of METs times the number of hours per week you exercise, you get your MET hours. And 7.5 to 15 METs a week drop risks of cancers uh, significantly, anywhere from 6 to 27%. Um, also, last night we talked about getting phytochemicals. These are found in the plant products, particularly the, the green leafy vegetables and the, uh, the carrots. Um, those pressed juices have been used by, oh, Gerson therapy for over about 100 years now. They have a, a significant response rate, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent is what they've been reporting of people with cancers um, having uh, remissions. Um, this afternoon, we'll talk about thermal hydrotherapy. Again, raising the body temperature up to turn on the immune system. And uh, at this time, we're going to look at intravenous vitamin C. We'll 
be looking at some herbs that can be used in cancer support and our effectiveness and also detoxification. Um, so, so as an introduction, to give you a perspective, um, there was a review, there was a book called uh, The Truth About Cancer, and in it, uh, they mentioned that uh, after five years of chemotherapy in their own literature, they recorded only a 2.1% survival rate. Now, this would imply that if you have cancer at the end of five years, there's only 2.1% only of patients getting chemotherapy are still alive. That's uh, what one oncologist was reported saying. Another one said 97% of people who undergo chemotherapy are dead in five years. And that study was placed in the 2004 edition of Clinical Oncology. Well, if you go on Amazon and you read a review of the book, uh, one person commented and says, Amir, 2.1% of cancer patients survive for longer than five years after undergoing chemotherapy. How can that possibly be when the overall survival, five-year survival, is 67%? He said it was a misrepresented study. So I thought, well, who's right? And where are they getting their, their numbers? Uh, is it true that the five-year survival for cancer patients is really 67% instead of 2.1%? Well, the 67% the reference is from Cancer Rehabilitation Principles and Practice. And uh, here we see that the overall five-year survival for all comers, all cancers in general is 66%. And they go and they list variations due to the types of cancers, but overall it was 67%. Um, so where did this 2.1% survival come from? It actually came from an article by uh, Morgan, Morgan and Bart Barton in 2004. They looked at five-year survivals of those not getting chemotherapy versus five-year survivals of those getting chemotherapy. And they looked at the improvement in five-year survivals. So the 2.1% number is actually the improvement in five-year survival, not the absolute five-year survival. Um, note that they give the the improvement, this, was, this study was actually done in Australia, and then they repeated it in America. And uh, there were two cancers that showed marked survival increases with chemotherapy. And these were, uh, that was a 2.1% overall, they averaged them. This was testicular cancer, um, had an increased survival of 37%. Hodgkin's lymphoma had an increased survival of 40.3%, a dramatic improvement in survival. Uh, however, the other 18 had uh, either no increase in survival or survival rates improved by 12% or less. Um, breast cancer, for instance, had only a 1.4% increase in survival if they added chemotherapy to this standard treatments. When you average them all up, the total or the average for all cancers getting chemotherapy was only 2.1% increase. Um, one of the difficulties in giving cancer for testicular uh, uh, cancers or um, the uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma is that uh, it puts people at risk for getting cancer later on from the chemotherapy. Uh, here's a quote from uh, up to date. Hodgkin lymphoma survivors are at risk of developing therapy-related complications. That means 
When they get chemotherapy, they have complications or they're at risk for complications later. These complications have surfaced, uh, well, they, they relate to uh, malignancies, which are serious. Cardiac disease, uh, Dr. Rubison is one that can affect the heart and cause weakening of the heart. I remember in residency, I followed a cardiologist who admitted a patient with heart failure from the chemotherapy. And he did, he was a wonderful cardiologist, he did everything he could to try to strengthen her heart, but he was unable to. And at the end of her stay, basically he sent her home with, to die. There was nothing else he could do for her. Um, that is a risk. Uh, Radiation-induced hypothyroidism. If you get radiation to the thyroid to treat cancers, it might knock your th thyroid out. Your thyroid will stop producing hormones. That's a relatively minor complication because we can just give thyroxin to substitute for that. And so that's really not too significant. The malignancies, however, in the cardiac disease are, are significant. Um, these complications have surfaced as significant causes of increased mortality among survivors. Screening for some of these entities is advised in hope that early detection may lead to better management. Okay. Okay, so with a... Um, Overall increase in survival using chemotherapy of only 2.1%. Um, people are looking for things that may, uh, alternative approaches that may uh, offer um, more significant advantages. And with that background, we're going to look at intravenous vitamin C, which has been used. Uh, approximately 90 epidemiological studies have examined the role of vitamin C, uh, or vitamin C-rich foods in cancer prevention. And the vast majority found statistically significant protective effect. So countries where they eat lots of foods with vitamin C uh, decrease the risk, the incidence of cancer. At physiologic blood levels, that means blood levels that you can obtain from the foods you eat, uh, oral vitamin C is an antioxidant. That means it can dispose of free radicals that can cause cancers. However, at high levels, obtainable only through intravenous uh, administration, vitamin C acts as an oxidant. It forms hydrogen peroxide and oxidizes and destroys cancer cells. Uh, we use hydrogen peroxide to clean wounds because it kills bacteria. You can use it as a mouthwash. It kills bacteria in the mouth. Uh, but it also can kill bacteria in your, in your body. Uh, it turns out that your body actually produces hydrogen peroxide. Uh, white cells, when they gobble up bacteria, they put it in a little phagosome, a little vesicle in the white cell, and the bacteria after ingestion by the white cell is still alive. And so to kill it, a, uh, a lysosome, which is another vesicle full of toxic chemicals, binds to that phagosome and releases its enzymes into the vacuole that has the bacteria, and that, those chemicals kill the bacteria. One of the chief enzymes in that vesicle is hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is actually used by our creator, put it there to help us fight infections. Um, does vitamin C intravenously actually work to prolong survival in cancer patients? Well, in 1976, two times Nobel laureate Linus Pauling and surgeon Ed Cameron used intravenous vitamin C to treat 100 terminally ill cancer patients on whom conventional treatments had failed. Um, and uh, what they did is they gave 10 grams of vitamin C intravenously daily for 10 days, and then they switched to oral vitamin C. Um, and what they found that was that the survival rates, when compared with 1,000 terminal cancer patients who did not get intravenous vitamin C, survival rates increased significantly. Here we see the survival curve is dramatically improved with intravenous vitamin C by more than about 4.2 times. Let me see if I can, is this going to work? There we go. 
What we see here is after 50 days, if they didn't get vitamin C, 36% were still alive after being diagnosed terminal and, not, and just getting comfort measures only. However, if they got vitamin C intravenously, it was 67%, almost double. By 100 days, comfort measures only, 12% survival. IV vitamin C, 53% survival. And so on down the road, 400 days, Terminal cancer patients, 16% survival with vitamin C versus 0.3% survival if they just got comfort measures only. Well, this was dramatic, um, but they said, well, you weren't comparing apples to apples. Uh, you're comparing, your patients were not as sick as the patients that just got comfort measures only. Uh, and they didn't have as serious a cancer. So they redid the test two years later, and they did the survival rates based on type of cancer, and they matched the patient's age within about five years so that we would have similar age, similar type of cancer, and then we compared, they compared the survivals. And for instance, if they had colon cancer, this is a survival rate, say at 100 days, would be 10% survival if they just got comfort measures only. But if they got IV vitamin C at 100 days, it was about 87% or so. Uh, dramatic increase in survival just by giving this intravenous uh, solution. And that was true for stomach cancer, bronchial cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, rectal cancer, bladder cancer, and ovarian cancers. Um, So they had evidence that this was effective in terms of survival. They also had further evidence that the vitamin C was actually killing the cells, the, the cancer cells. This evidence was based on um, what they call tumor lysis syndrome. If you have a cancer that is very sensitive to standard chemotherapy, the chemotherapy can go in and kill the cancer cells so quickly that toxins from those cells are released into the bloodstream. And you can get high levels of, say, uric acid, which can cause gout, which can actually shut the kidneys down. That's called tumor lysis syndrome. It only happens when you're killing the cancer cells off very rapidly. Well, in their study, they actually, out of 100 patients, they actually had four or five people get tumor lysis syndrome, which again is evidence that you're killing the cancer cells. Now, we want to avoid tumor lysis syndrome. It's a complication, but it did demonstrate that it can and does kill cancer cells. Um, we have ways now of preventing tumor lysis syndrome if we give intravenous vitamin C. And it's the similar means that standard chemotherapy uses to avoid tumor lysis syndrome. Um, Okay. Uh, these are other studies that showed uh, dramatic improvements giving IV vitamin C in cancer patients. These were done by, uh, in, uh, in other countries. Um, here's one done in uh, Japan. Um, and again, showed dramatic improvement in survival. Um, well, of course, this brought a lot of discussion and a lot of controversy, uh, Linus Pauling's results. And his results, of course, were challenged. And so I said, well, your study was not randomized. It wasn't double-blinded. It wasn't, you know, you didn't have a control group and a test group. Uh, so Mayo Clinic said, we are going to do the definitive study. So they took patients, randomized them, placebo-controlled, blinded the patients, uh, the, the physicians, as to who was getting treatment and who wasn't. And at the end of the first study, there was no improvement in those getting 10 grams of vitamin C daily. So they repeated the study, and again, they found no improvement. And because of this, intravenous vitamin C was set on the shelf for about eight years or so, until somebody said, oh, Mayo Clinic was giving the vitamin C 
orally. Linus Pauling was giving it intravenously. Is there a difference? Um, well, yes, there is. And this isn't a small oversight. It's pretty common knowledge that when a person has a pneumonia or something, that's serious pneumonia, we admit them to the hospital so we can give intravenous antibiotics rather than oral antibiotics so we can get higher blood levels. Do we get higher blood levels with intravenous vitamin C versus oral vitamin C? And yes, we do. It turns out that if you take 10 grams of vitamin C and you give it orally, blood level can only get as high as about 4.2 milligrams per deciliter. But if you give it intravenously, you get about 106 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, today, we shoot for people doing intravenous vitamin C for cancer support. We shoot for levels 350 to 400 milligrams per deciliter and without any uh, significant uh, side effects. So once this was understood, then intravenous vitamin C came back into more uh, common use. Well, since then, they've done studies to see what cancers are sensitive and what cancers, and how sensitive cancer cells are to intravenous vitamin C. These are uh, studies, what they do is they put cancer cells in culture media, then they add vitamin C, and they found out what level of vitamin C kills half the cancer cells. That's the lethal dose 50. And uh, here we see that for human cancer cells, there's a range of sensitivities. Some are killed with as little as seven milligrams per deciliter. Some, it takes about 350 milligrams per deciliter. And so, because we don't know beforehand how sensitive cancer cells are, we shoot for this, this higher number, about 350 milligrams per deciliter. Notice also that this lymphoma, the most sensitive cancer, still required seven milligrams per deciliter, and the most we can get orally with pills and supplements is about four, maximum of five milligrams per deciliter. So oral vitamin C can't get blood levels up high enough to get the effects we're seeing here. These are more sensitivity studies on different cancer cells. And here you see uh, these are mice, normal cells, and you can't kill them with vitamin C. Healthy cells are immune to vitamin C, which is a good thing. But the cancer cells, these are the different sensitivities of the mouse cancer cells. Here are rat cancer cells, similar. Here we have um, human cancer cells, and here we see that there are some cancer cells that are immune to intravenous vitamin C. We don't have a good way of knowing beforehand which are sensitive and which are not, but the majority of cancer cells were sensitive. Um, so how does vitamin C kill cancer cells? Um, vitamin C works on the outside of the cancer cells, not on the inside. Um, if vitamin C is placed on the outside of a cancer cell, some of it enters and some of it remains outside and the cell dies. But if we give oxidized vitamin C on the outside, it gets absorbed into the cancer cell and turns to vitamin C in the cancer cell, those cancer cells didn't die. And this was showing us that it was the intravenous vitamin C in the cancer cell that was killing the cells rather than the vitamin C outside the cancer cells. Well, then they had another question. Uh, what they noted was that vitamin C in solution will generate hydrogen peroxide. Um, and they wondered, is it the vitamin C killing the cancer cell or is it the hydrogen peroxide? Well, um, so what they did was they put cancer cells in a, in a culture medium and they added vitamin C and then they measured how much peroxide was generated 
uh, that would kill half the cancer cells. Once they determined that, then they took another vat of cancer cells and they added the vitamin C and then they added a chemical which would gobble up the peroxide as soon as it was generated. So in that cell, we have vitamin C but no peroxide and the cancer cells did not die. So then they took another vat of cells and they added just the peroxide, no vitamin C. And so in that vat of cells, half the cancer cells died, just like in the first vat. So they said, oh, it must be the hydrogen peroxide killing the cells rather than the vitamin C. And uh, so I won't go through these. So the question then is, um, well then, why are we giving vitamin C? Why don't we just give hydrogen peroxide intravenously if that's what's killing the cells? Uh, what happens is when hydrogen peroxide is mixed with red blood cells, the hydrogen peroxide goes into the red blood cells and gets destroyed instantly. And so within seconds, there is no measurable amount of peroxide in the, red, in the bloodstream. So you can't infuse it and expect it to go to the cancer cells and kill them. And this is why drinking peroxide wouldn't be expected to have any beneficial effect for treating cancers. Uh, and why intravenous vitamin C, I mean intravenous peroxide wouldn't be expected to help either. So why, are, why does intravenous vitamin C work or how does it work? It actually works by going into the bloodstream the bloodstream doesn't destroy it immediately. The vitamin C is carried throughout the body. It gets in the fluid surrounding the cancer cells and locally that's where it produces the hydrogen peroxide to kill the cancer cells. And that's the mechanism by which we understand at least today that vitamin C is, is helpful in, in treating cancers. Um, there is something we have to do before giving high-dose vitamin C, we have to check for an enzyme deficiency. Um, basically, you need the enzyme, it's in red here, G6PD, for red cells to destroy the peroxide. Um, if you don't have that enzyme, the red cells cannot destroy the peroxide quickly enough, and the peroxide will destroy the red cells. So you can get breakup of the red cells um, in this situation. But it's a simple test. I think it costs twenty, thirty dollars at uh, LabCorp. And uh, we just test for the enzyme deficiency and if you don't have it, then we can give high doses. So here's the big picture. Um, vitamin C is brought in by the bloodstream. Um, it goes throughout the body, goes into the fluid surrounding the cancer cells and the healthy cells. It then generates an ascorbic radical which generates hydrogen peroxide and it's this peroxide which kills the cancer cells. Now, um, we've been using this for over maybe 10 years now and, uh, but it's, you know, it's kind of involved. It, invi it you know, involves starting IV, giving intravenous fluids and intravenous vitamin C and we thought, well, isn't there a simpler way to give vitamin C to get high blood levels? And uh, at that time, they came out with lipospheric vitamin C. This is vitamin C encapsulated with, uh, to make it more fat soluble to get higher blood levels. Well, we had a chemist who came through one of our lifestyle programs who said, oh, I want to try this out and see if it really works, if it's helpful. So when he went home, he took 10 grams of vitamin C and he got a blood level, vitamin C blood level. And then at 60 minutes, he got another level and at 90 minutes, he got another level. And then, uh, but he found that he couldn't get it more than about 4.7 milligrams per deciliter, which is what you can get with just regular vitamin C. Um, he did it again with eight grams and another 10 gram trial. And again, neither dose was able to get the vitamin C levels up. So again, we're left with um, having to give it intravenously. Um, here's what uh, one uh, study showed with uh, intravenous vitamin C levels 
if we give it intravenously, uh, gave it to a young man, 125 grams at one point and uh, 112 grams at another point, and we see we have levels over, uh, over 300 at uh, about 30, 30 minutes after the infusion. The half-life is about three and a half hours. So it doesn't last long in the bloodstream. It drops fairly quickly. It's metabolized or taken out in the, uh, through the kidneys. Um, is it actually helpful in treating cancers? Um, yes, the Reardon Clinic in Kansas has been using IV vitamin C for over 35 years now. In the 1980s, when the Mayo Clinic study came out, they apparently saw that it was a faulty study, and they kept using it. And this was one case study. These are case studies that you can get on their website. <clears throat> this is just one example. Um, September 1995, 52-year-old female had a left nephrectomy. They took out the left kidney <clears throat> for renal cell carcinoma, cancer of the kidney. CT scan and chest x-ray show clear lung fields. There was no apparent spread no mediastinal masses, no bone lesions, normal liver, normal spleen. So it didn't look like it had spread anywhere. It felt like they got it all. However, in March 1996, chest x-ray showed lesions consistent with metastasis. It looked like it had spread to the lungs. It was, just wasn't big enough to see it on the original chest x-rays. Um, and it continued to increase in number and size through October 1996. She declined chemotherapy and radiation. She was started on multiple supplements, IV vitamin C increased to a dose of 65 grams twice a week uh, and no refined sugar diet. By June 1997, chest x-rays showed resolution of the right lung nodules and a marked decrease in size in the left upper lung nodular infiltrate. She discontinued the IV vitamin C at this time, at that time, but continued her oral nutritional support. Uh, by January 1998, uh, chest x-ray showed clearing of the left upper law nodular infiltrate and she was well with no apparent disease. When we have patients coming to say Heartland and getting the IV vitamin C or coming to our clinic in, near Frederick, Maryland or near Hagerstown, Maryland, um, we can start them on vitamin C but we only see them there for either 11 days at the Lifestyle Center or three days at home. What do they do when they go home? You can actually go to this website, uh, acam.org, it's the American College for Advancement of Medicine, and you can type in your zip code, and they will give you a list of practitioners in your zip code, and then you would need to call them and see, do you give intravenous vitamin C, and, and they can uh, then um, advise you whether this is something they provide or not, uh, because Again, we're talking long term. You're going to need to take it six months or so uh, to get a significant response. Um, this is the therapy that we typically use at the lifestyle centers. And we, the idea at the lifestyle center or at our, our intensives at, in Hagerstown is to train the patients, get them started on the program, but train them so they can continue it at home because the, the biggest challenge is you, you got to continue it for, well, six months to a year, sometimes up to two years to maintain uh, the benefits. Okay, so um, that's intravenous vitamin C. There is a, uh, a problem that um, Gerson therapy ran into with the juicing protocols, which we discussed last night. Turns out that within about six weeks, if you're doing the carrot juice and the green juices, press juices, um, within about six weeks, the immune system becomes strong and it starts killing off the cancer cells. The cancer cells can then release toxins and the person can actually feel sick get fever, chills, malaise, uh, feel like they have a virus. And that's from the toxins being released. It's called a healing reaction. It's a good sign, but um, it, it, it would indicate that we need to get rid of the toxins more quickly. And how do you do that? Um, 
Well, we do the, what they call coffee enemas. These are enemas that are put into the colon, taken to the liver. The liver says, oh, this is toxic. It revs up its detoxifying process, and that detoxification process clears the bloodstream of the caffeine and the other toxins that are being released by the, um, by the healing reaction. So coffee, is it really a toxin and does it work? We want to look at some of the science behind it. Um, well, we know that tea is a toxin and that's actually why plants produce it. For instance, a tea plant in uh, Japan, if it senses that an animal is eating it, it says, oh no, I'm being eaten, I'd better produce more caffeine. So plant gets eaten a little bit today, animal goes away. The tea plant responds by producing more caffeine. The next day the animal comes back, starts eating the tea plant again, and says, oh yuck, too much caffeine, I'm going to find another plant. Um, the tea growers understand this, and so the day before they harvest the tea, the workers go through the rows and they beat the plants with sticks. The plants think they're being eaten, they produce more caffeine, and the next day they harvest the leaves and they get more caffeine in their leaves by doing this, this procedure. How does caffeine turn on our liver's detoxification process? Because our, our liver does see it as a toxin. Um, when caffeine goes into the intestines, you see it in red there, it's absorbed into the bloodstream, the portal system, and the first stop of the bloodstream from the intestines is the liver. And this makes sense because the food you eat goes into the intestines and the body wants to process this food through the liver before it dumps it into the rest of the bloodstream. And so in the, in the liver, the caffeine is um, processed. Now caffeine has an effect of dilating the portal system to increase blood flow to increase this process when caffeine is introduced. Once the caffeine reaches the liver, it's filtered through the liver where the toxins are dumped into the bile ducts. And uh, there's the bile ducts in green there. And uh, the caffeine is carried by the bloodstream. It's dumped into the bile, the red blood cells go back, and the caffeine is in the bile ducts is then carried uh, down to the gallbladder, and the bile is stored there until you eat a fatty meal and it needs those bile salts and cholesterol in them. The bile squeezes, the gallbladder squeezes, the bile then is ejected into the intestines and it's then carried out in the stool. Um, does this caffeine actually increase the flow of bile and the ability for the liver to get rid of toxins? We did have a, uh, a cancer patient, he had pancreatic cancer, and if you notice, the pancreas surrounds the bile duct, and the pancreatic cancer had shut off his bile duct. His bile couldn't get released into the intestines, and it backed up into the bloodstream, and his eyes were bright yellow. They looked like they would glow at night. Um, he was one of the first patients we ever tried a coffee enema on. We gave him one enema, and in an hour, his eyes were clear. The jaundice had gone. In three hours, it came back. Gave him another enema, and it, in about an hour, it went away again. Um, the effect lasts about four hours, and that's why in Gerson therapy, they'll give coffee enema about once every four hours. The other effects are is that it will decrease pain symptoms uh, significantly, coffee enemas do. And uh, for that reason, many patients, even though they're prescribed every four hours, they'll ask for it sooner. Uh, it's fairly simple to give. We do one training session where we show them how to do the coffee enema, and then after that, we just give them the bags and the tube, and they do it themselves. They can do it at home. Uh, we have the recipes in our little cancer manual uh, showing you how to prepare them. Um, the other thing that caffeine does is it stimulates the enzyme that helps remove toxins from the bloodstream. Turns out that in the liver, any toxin is bound to glutathione. 
Um, if it's not bound to glutathione, if the toxin is dumped into the intestines without binding to glutathione, it will get reabsorbed into the bloodstream, just like it would for any food, and you won't get rid of the toxin. But when you bind the toxin to glutathione, when it's dumped into the intestines, it's too big, it can't get reabsorbed into the bloodstream, and then it gets carried out in the stool. So an important key part of detoxifying the body is revving up this process whereby glutathione and the toxin are combined. And that's combined. And it's the enzyme glutathione as transferase that accelerates this process. Um, so under the influence of coffee, enema, the glutathione as transferase enzyme increases its activity 650%. They've measured that increase in activity. So no other chemical that we know of has that ability to do that to such an extent. Uh, once the uh, toxins are combined with glutathione, they're emptied into the bile ducts, and then they flow out in the stool. Now, we understand warnings given by Ellen White. Uh, she mentions that coffee is a hurtful indulgence, temporarily excites the mind to unwanted action, but the after effect is exhaustion, frustration, paralysis, and mental, moral, physical powers. The mind becomes innervated, and unless through determined effort the habit is overcome, the activity of the brain is permanently lessened. All these nerve irritants are wearing away the life forces, and the restlessness caused by shattered nerves, the impatience, mental feebleness become a warring element, antagonizing to spiritual progress. Then should not the, those who advocate temperance and reform be awake to counteract the evils of these injurious drinks? In some cases, it's as difficult to break up the tea and coffee habit as it is for the inebriate to discontinue the use of liquor. Um, those who resort to tea and coffee for stimulation to labor will feel the evil effects of this course of trembling nerves and lack of self-control. Tired nerves need rest and quiet. Nature needs time to recuperate her exhausted energies, but if her forces are goaded on by use of stimulants, there is, whenever this process is repeated, a lessening of the real force. For a time, more may be accomplished under the unnatural stimulus, but gradually it becomes more difficult to rouse the energies to the desired point, and at last, exhausted nature can no longer respond. So she recommended not using coffee as a regular drink as part of the diet. Did she ever use coffee? Actually, she did. Um, this, is the, this is the case where she used it as a medicine, not as a regular form part of her diet. She writes, I have not knowingly drunk a cup of genuine coffee for 20 years, only as I stated during my sickness for a medicine. I drank a cup of coffee very strong with a raw egg broken into it. it. Says, I do not use tea, either green or black, not a spoonful has passed my lips for many years, except when crossing the ocean. And once since on this side, I took it as a medicine when I was sick and vomiting. In such circumstances, it may be prove a present relief. So if nausea and vomiting was justification for using it, um, toxemia from a high tumor load breaking down, I believe if they're feeling the ill side effects of that, it's justification for using the coffee enemas. Uh, I don't recommend it for stage one or stage two cancers where the toxic load is not high but for people with stage three or stage four cancers, toxic levels are high, then this can be very helpful uh, with their symptoms. Um, there was one story about a, a little boy, he's five or six, and he, uh, he saw his dad was using these coffee enemas for treatments, and he got used to it and he understood how they worked. But then his dad took him to a conference and his dad was talking to someone in the lobby during a break, and the kid kind of wandered off, and he came back horrified. He says, Dad, they're drinking the coffee here. <laughs> so, so, okay, Easy Act Tea. Has anyone heard of Easy Act Tea? You've heard of that, yes. It's one of the more common herbal teas used to help support cancer treatments. Um, working as a surgical nurse in Halliburry, Ontario, a nurse case met an 80-year-old woman 
and this was the beginning of the use of EZAC for uh, cancer support. Um, this woman had a scarred, gnarled breast. The woman explained that she'd been diagnosed with advanced cancer and a mastectomy was recommended. She opted to be treated by the Indian herbal healer who gave her the herbs for EZAC tea daily. Her tumors gradually shrank and disappeared. More than two decades later, when Nurse Case met her in 1922, she was totally cancer-free. Since then, accepting only donations for her services, Nurse Case treated hundreds of cases of cancer with EZAC tea, given either orally or intravenously. Now, we have the oral recipes. You can get them online for making EZAC tea. I don't. I do not have the method by which she gave intravenous uh, EZAC tea. She did this for 50 years. It has worked to bring cancer remissions, prolonged lives, and ease pain. Many had previously been considered hopeless or terminal. She had an offer to test her therapy in a laboratory with renowned physician, Dr. Banting, but declined as she would have to abandon 600 of her patients coming weekly to her clinic for treatments. 1938, 55,000 people signed a petition supporting a bill to legalize it in Canada, including patients, families, and physicians. Canadian Parliament came within three votes of legalizing it in 1938. A commission was formed to investigate its claims. 378 of cases patients showed up to testify. Only 49 were allowed to speak. Um, Annie Bonar testified that her diagnosed uterine and bowel cancer had spread after radium treatments until her arm had swelled to double its size and turned black. Weighing 90 pounds, the night before she was to have her arm amputated, she opted for EZAC therapy instead. After four months of the herbal treatment, her arm was back to normal and she gained 60 pounds. A series of x-rays, exams revealed she was cancer-free. However, the Royal Commission listed Annie Bonar's case as recovery due to surgery when she didn't have surgery. Um, Walter Hampson, another patient of case who came to testify had cancer of the lip, diagnosed by pathologist, refusing radium, he underwent EZAC therapy and was restored to normal. Despite the fact that he never had an operation uh, other than removal of the tidal nodule for analysis, the commission classified his case as recovery due to surgery. He didn't have surgery. Um, Dr. Charles Brush, former physician to President John F. Kennedy, he declared that EZAC has merit in the treatment of cancer and revealed that he cured his own cancer with it. In a notarized statement made April 6, 1990, Dr. Brush testified, I endorse this therapy even today, for I have in fact cured my own cancer, the original site of which was the lower bowels. At the age of 90, in 1978, Nurse Case died from a heart impairment, but the herbal supplement is still uh, available. It's supplied as a tea or gelatin capsules. Now, I don't recommend the gelatin capsules to get the benefit of these herbal teas, generally you, ha you have to boil them. For instance, Easyac tea, you boil it at night for about 20 minutes. Then you let it sit on the stove with a covered lid for about 12 hours. In the morning then, you heat it up once more, just, just below a boil. As soon as it gets heated up, then you pour it through a strainer and you can make two quarts at a time. Um, and the recommended dosage is usually one cup daily, and two quarts will then last you about a week. So if you make the Easy Act tea once a week, you have a supply for the whole, the whole week. Um, it is supplied as a tea, sheep sorrel herb, it contains the main uh, anti-cancer phytochemicals, burdock roots, also found in another tonic, hoxy tonic, which has been used in the past, slippery elm inner bark, and turkey rhubarb root. Burdock root is a, a key ingredient. It's also a major ingredient in Hoxi herbal remedy. 1966, two Hungarian scientists reported considerable anti-tumor activity in a purified fraction of burdock. Turkey rhubarb has, was also shown to have anti-tumor activity in the sarcoma 37 animal test. And um, this has been, and so, and that's why it's included <coughs> in, the, uh, in the protocols. So one, one simple protocol is just to use the teas in the morning, and in the afternoon you can make your 
suppressed juices, um, if you have stage three or stage four cancer, you may want to be using coffee enemas. And immune boosting herbs, these can be used alternatively for one to two weeks alternating. Um, vitamin D and vitamin C are important. Vegan diet without oil is important. Um, we can also give fever baths, intravenous vitamin C, which we just talked about, and then ozone therapy is something we're not going to get to this, uh, this weekend. Um, that's basically uh, what I wanted to share with you this morning. Again, this afternoon, we want to learn how to turn on your immune system with, uh, they call it thermal hydrotherapy or fever baths, a common term. Um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm not sure when time is for this. I don't know if we have time for questions or this is break time. Oh, till the bell rings. Okay. Were there any questions? Okay. Well. No questions? Okay. I guess we're. Yes, sir. How long to do it? Um, Reardon Clinic, who's had probably the most experience using it, uh, will give it, if you have stage 3 or stage 4 cancer, twice, two to three times a week for six months or so. Um, Gerson therapy with the juicing, they used to say, okay, we want you to do it one year after you're, you don't have any evidence of cancer. Since then, they've extended it to two years because even after one year, if they stop it, sometimes the cancer can come back. Um, the problem, juicing can be somewhat expensive if you're getting you know, the produce daily. Intravenous vitamin C is expensive and it's time consuming. And so to continue it beyond six months, or even to do it six months, is expensive and time consuming. A normal Treatment runs anywhere from 225 to $250 per infusion. If you get 75 grams to 100 grams, which is a normal target dose, you have to infuse it slowly. It takes two minutes per gram. So 100 grams would take 200 minutes. That's about three and a half hours. So someone has to come you know, twice a week for three and a half hours and get an infusion. Um, so you know, for a person, has you know heavy tumor load or something? Yeah, it, it's, it'd be worth it. But for just prevention or something, it it's, it wouldn't be worth the time and, and finances. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, <laughs> things that will, you know, increase your risk of cancer. This afternoon, we're actually going to show one of the first historic cases where a suppressed immune system opened the doors for cancer. Anything you do that suppresses the immune system will cause cancer um, or make you open for cancer. Lack of sleep can suppress the immune system. Um, high fat foods can suppress the immune system. They say, well, I've been a, veg a vegan all my life. The, the problem is, <coughs> well, let me back up. We do know that insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes, diabetes is a high risk factor for cancer. So if you can avoid insulin resistance, you can decrease your risk of cancer. How do you avoid insulin resistance? Well, you avoid the oxidized fats. That seems to be the, there's mo the most recent evidence indicate that oxidized fats is the problem. 
Um, where do you get oxidized fats? Well, the fats in, say, the, in the olive is not oxidized. Fats, when you extract the oil out of the olive, it becomes oxidized. Uh, Dr. Vogel did some tests showing that olive oil caused insulin resistance after just one meal. But when he gave antioxidants with the olive oil, it did not. So how does a vegan get you know, high fat foods? The problem is, is that the food industry realizes that, okay, people want to go vegetarian because it's healthier, but they like the taste of the high fat meat products. So how do we make plant foods taste like the high fat foods they're used to? We use vegetable oils. And when you add the vegetable oils to the vegetable proteins, you get the high fat content and the oxidized fat that goes along with it. And that can be a problem. Uh, we, we looked at some of these vegetable hot dogs. We cut them in half and pressed down on one side of the, of the, the hot dog. And the, the oil just oozed out of them. It was, it was that way. And we have a lot of vegans who come through the program for diabetes. And they say, I'm a vegan, how come I've got diabetes? Well, we look at the oxidized fats that they're eating, and that seems to be the problem. When they went to, they actually went to uh, an olive press, and they, where they pressed the olive oil out of the olive. And they said, oh, you're, you researchers, you want some olive oil? They said, no, we want your pulp, the stuff you're throwing away. And when they looked at the stuff they were throwing away, they tested it for our body's main antioxidant, which is glutathione, I mentioned it earlier today. And there were huge amounts of glutathione in the pulp they were throwing away. So that antioxidant, when you make olive oil, is separated from the olive oil. And now you have olive oil that's exposed to the air and becomes oxidized, and that can cause the insulin resistance. And so I advise patients to avoid the the oils, the free oils, if you're vegan, and that's a big step, and that's one of the more challenging things because all processed foods just about in America have the, the processed oils in them. Um, but this has also been recognized by Nathan Pritikin, who's a, he was a health reformer in the early 70s, reversed heart disease with a plant-based diet. He did before and after angiograms through Loma Linda University down the road and they, uh, um, and he advocates no oil diet. By the way, when they asked him to speak at one of our conventions, he said, you know, I've read the books by Ellen White. He says, you have a gold mine of information there. And then he said, but you're just sitting on it. He says, you gotta get out and start sharing this with, with the world. But, uh, and that's why Ellen White, she said, olive oil is eaten in the olive is most beneficial. And she didn't say olive oil is eaten out of the olive is <laughs> most beneficial. So if you like the high fat foods, get them in their natural state, the unoxidized fat, in the avocado, in the olives, in the whole foods. How long does it take to oxidize foods? Peel a banana, put it on a shelf, what happens to it? it turns brown, it's being oxidized. It happens fairly quickly. Um, so sleep, avoiding the high fat foods, exercise as we have a whole talk on how exercise decreases risk of cancer. And um, getting the vegetables, um, either through pressed juices or carrot juices, green leafy vegetables, to increase your phytochemical. Those are good questions. Yeah, thank you. I think what that was the bell, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks.